Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Um, what I would like is not just to have a day where I'm talking at you, but I'd like through you seeing how the Lord so kindly has in power and love built up and nurtured his church, how the gates of hell have not prevailed against it, I'd like you to be encouraged by the sovereign hand of our God, to see how majestically he moves in operating all history. I'd like you to see the continuity of our faith, to see... This isn't some kooky thing that we're just into right now. That there are believers thousands of miles away, a couple of thousand years ago, who had a faith just like yours. But also to see that actually they often sound quite different to us. And so you've got wise Christians who are saying things that we wouldn't quite say. And do we want to agree with that or not? So I'm going to chuck out some things that might just pose challenges to you, and I won't always answer. I'll chuck out something and just see whether you like it or not. And I may not give an indication of whether you should like it or not. We'll just see how it flies. And so I'm hoping that you'll learn from the wisdom of great Christians, and you'll learn from some mistakes as well. So we'll see how the Lord's been working, and how how his people have been working. Now, I'm going to kick the story off. So, first session, big mega story. I'm going to kick it off by telling you the big story of the church from the apostolic generation on. But what you need to know is that um, the Lord, of course, has already been preparing. So we're going to look at... um, Yeah, thank you. Um, (coughs) We're going to look at the spread of the gospel in the first couple of hundred years after the New Testament. But it's important to know that the Lord had already been preparing for the spread of the gospel in extraordinary ways such that you can understand the rapidity of gospel growth. When you see things like, for example, Alexander the Great from here in Macedonia had basically conquered all this swathe of territory right out to India. Making Greek the common tongue right across the region and and Latin was pretty common, but Greek was well-spoken over here. So you've got, extraordinarily, not all sorts of different tongues, but when the apostles and the first evangelists go out from Jerusalem, you've got a world pretty united in language. The word can spread fast. And the Roman Empire has very kindly arranged fast means of transport. The apostles can travel fast. And also, there's been the Jewish dispersion. So you've got a network of synagogues right round the known world, um, which not only becomes a network of preaching hotspots for evangelists as they go out, but there's a certain knowledge of the Old Testament and knowledge of the Messiah being spread. So I just want you to have that in the background to be able to see the Lord's been at work. We're not starting from page one here. Yes, yeah, so that's the situation. And so what happens is um, the story of gospel growth is, is absolutely phenomenal speed of growth. Uh, if you want to read some figures on this, uh, there's a fascinating uh, book called The Rise of Christianity by Stark, where he just tries to map out the actual figures. And the growth rate is absolutely mind-blowing. Within the first generation, I mean, the story is the apostles went to India. Um, St. Simon apparently, apparently was martyred in Leicestershire. Hmm. May not have been. But the story of the apostles going far and wide certainly maps to what we see with Mark going into Egypt. We know the Gospels going down to Ethiopia. There's evidence that, um, by evidence, we're, we're on pretty thin ground for a lot of what we're saying with this early stuff. But there's evidence that the gospel might even have got as far as Japan by the year 100. It seems to be in Britain by the same stage, right across Gaul, all sorts of places in Gaul, France. Um, 
it's spread all over the place. Within a hundred years, the gospel has infiltrated extraordinarily the known world. Now, you, you see, for example, by the mid-60s in Rome, the Christians are a serious presence, such that they're, co- they're considered to be politically significant for Nero to treat them out and single them out. Now, for all that extraordinary growth, the growth is not easy. It's not easy growth because of persecution. Now, you get to see persecution and martyrdom in the New Testament, of course. Now, what happens is this. Let me just tell you the story of that. The Emperor Trajan, by the way, don't worry about the dates too much. Just get this as a big picture. So I'll chuck out a few dates for you to get, get, your, get your mind around roughly where we're at. But I'm not after you trying to memorize these dates. Okay? But in the year 110, the Emperor Trajan, he starts formalizing the persecution of Christians. Um, and he establishes a policy which is basically a don't ask, don't tell policy. So don't tell us you're a Christian and we won't persecute you. But if you tell us you're a Christian, well, there's a problem. And we will persecute you. Now, the, so, so generally what happens is most Christian persecution in the early days is just by mobs. And the reason Christians are persecuted is because, it's not so much because they're Christians, people don't really understand what Christianity is, it's because they're not worshipping the state gods and the emperor. Now, if you don't worship the emperor, well, that's considered to be politically seditious. Why won't you worship the emperor? Are you actually for some other king against the emperor? Are you not loyal to Rome? You're politically dangerous. And if you don't worship the state gods, you know, Jupiter and Mercury and that lot, well... Think about it. The gods are those who keep things going. They keep the empire going. The gods make the crops grow. They stop floods from happening. And if they're angry, they'll send famine. That sort of thing. So if you don't keep these gods happy, and they need to be kept happy, they're grumpy. They're a grumpy, nasty lot. We all know it, but we won't say it. So we need to keep them happy with constant sacrifices. If you're not sacrificing to them, you are basically inducing famine, flood, crop failure. Why would you do that? You're just asocial. Does that make sense? There's also some big misunderstandings of Christianity. So some rumours start going around that get very popular by 2nd century, certainly, that Christians are widely engaged in gross sexual immorality, incest, cannibalism, and murder. You think, why would that go around? Well, because they meet in secret. I don't know why they're meeting in secret. They've got something to hide? Well, because they'll get persecuted if they don't meet in secret. So that's why they're meeting in secret. They meet in secret, and there they call each other brothers and sisters. And they give each other, their brothers and sisters, the kiss of peace. You see how that gets blown up into the charge of incest? And there, they eat the Son of God. Right? That's cannibalism and murder. So there's there's one story that goes around that Christians like to meet at night, roll babies in flour and stab them and eat them. You see where it's coming from? It's not absolutely ludicrous. They're eating the Son of God somehow in bread. You see how the stories are going? Well, so generally persecution tends to be popularly led. It's not particularly top-down from the emperor. Then in the third century, things change. And it starts becoming much more official. In the year 249, the emperor Decius, orders all citizens to make sacrifices. Now, this is a sneaky way of sniffing out the Christians. Because if you won't make a sacrifice, well, we know who you are. So we've we've not actually asked if you're a Christian, but we can now tell. So that, um, that starts hotting things up. And we start having more and more emperors through the 3rd century who instigate official persecution against the Christians. Just one really weird, kooky thing that I've spotted in looking at um, emperors who order the persecution of Christians. They all get killed by foreign armies. 
just, just one little weird historical kooky thing. They, all of them, they get killed by, by foreigners. Um, so the Emperor Decius gets killed in uh, 251, two years later. Uh, then a few years after that, the emperors um, Valerian and Gallienus, uh, the co-emperors, they now hot things up a lot more. They now order a search and destroy policy. Hunt them down. Well, Valerian is then killed by the Persians. Um, the Persians were... Sorry, um, that's, I'll tell you about him later. The Persians were over here, and the Goths, the other main en enemy up here. Well, Valerian gets killed. His co-emperor Gallienus gets, gets whiff of the trend of what happens to emperors who persecute Christians, and he stops the persecution. But all this time, Christianity is growing, spreading. And so you see around this time, for example, the bishop of Antioch, um, Antioch over here, the bishop of Antioch, he's asked to become governor of the city. He's considered that the bishop of the city is considered to be such a responsible, respected man. He becomes governor of the city. The years um, 270 to 275, you see the emperor Aurelian on the throne. And Aurelian now makes Jesus one of his household gods. So he's got lots of gods, but Jesus is now one of them. So he's not a Christian, but He's got some sort of interest in Jesus. I, I, um, this isn't unknown today, of course. I, I was speaking to a Hindu background believer um, a couple of weeks ago, and she was saying, yeah, that's my family. My Hindu family have got Jesus as one of their household gods. Well, so you see the growth of Christianity and persecution hotting up. Let me now take you to this guy. The Emperor Diocletian, and everything changes, everything changes with Diocletian. Diocletian orders that he now be known as Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. And now he has, Diocletian, he is the sole emperor of a whopping empire. He's a very, very capable guy. But he realises this empire is simply unmanageable. He's got enemies over here and enemies up here. And he's constantly marching backwards and forwards to face them, face Goths and Persians. So what he does is he splits the empire in half down this line here. There. Okay? He splits it in half, an eastern half and a western half. You can still feel that split line today. It's Still there. This is um, from the year 300 or so. And so, I mean, if, you, if you're walking along where it says Dalmatia here around Croatia, Serbia, you'll notice it as you're walking past the Catholic church one minute and then you walk across the line and you go past an Orthodox church the next minute. You've just crossed the line. It's still there. And in the eastern half of the empire, increasingly they would speak Greek. In the western half, they were increasingly speaking just Latin. And this is where you're seeing Catholicism in the west and orthodoxy, eastern orthodoxy, um, in the east. Starting to grow as two branches of the church that don't understand each other in language or increasingly in theology. And what Diocletian did... Um, is he basically said, let's now have four emperors. Okay. So we'll have two emperors in the east and two emperors in the west. Okay. You'll have a senior emperor, the Augustus. And then basically you have his junior apprentice emperor, who we'll call the Caesar. And when the Augustus dies, Caesar can take over. So you've got a nice line of continuity set up. Does that make sense? So you've got two Augusti and two Caesars. A Caesar in the West and a senior Augustus in the West and a senior Augustus in the East and a junior Caesar in the East. Does that make sense? So we've now split the empire. We can look after it well. Now, just that, that's worth holding in your mind for a moment because that's going to be important. Now, so you split the empire and then in the year 303 he instigates what 
gets called the Great Persecution, which lasts, depending on where you are, from two to ten years. This is the year 303. Now, that date is worth remembering. And this persecution is so widespread and so intensive, partly because it's financially worth it. Because Diocletian offers tax breaks to regions that kill their quota of Christians. So you want to bring them in. Hunt them down, and you'll get a tax break. Um, Quite extraordinarily, Diocletian, after being called Dominus et Deus, he actually retired from being emperor. He retired, he had a palace um, here in Split, and he retired to grow cabbages. And that's what he did for the last few years of his life. Isn't that absolutely extraordinary? He steps down from the throne of the world as Dominus et Deus to grow cabbages. (laughs) Anyway, where we're at then is in the 300s, we have a situation where it is extraordinarily unlikely that the emperor of Rome is about to be a Christian. That is just not going to happen. Witness the power of the Lord now. As I introduce you to Constantine the Great, or as our German friends would call him, Constantine the Gross. Now, Constantine, he was... Um, he was the son of Constantius, who was one of Diocletian's junior Caesars. Okay, so he's over here. Now, his dad died. So his dad, Constantius, is junior Caesar over the western half of the empire. His dad dies when Constantine is in York. And right by where the minster is today, his army declare he is Caesar. They all declare Hail Caesar in York. Now, the thing I want you to know about Constantine, Constantine was a worshipper of Sol Invictus, the invincible sun, the sun god. Okay, and in everything I'm going to say, I just want you to read everything through that. He's the worshipper of the sun. Well, Constantine marches on Rome. So he marches gathering bigger and bigger armies to meet his rival Maxentius in Rome. And he's going to meet him just outside Rome. And on the night before the battle, he has a dream. And just before the battle, what happens is he sees probably this sign. It's usually said to be a cross but it's almost certainly this sign, in fact, the Cairo symbol in the sky. And so he looks up into the sky before the battle and he sees this shining sign in the sky. Remember, he worships the sun and he looks up and he doesn't see the sun, he sees this. Um, this, by the way, it kind of looks kind of cross-like. It's the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek. So it's called the Cairo symbol. Uh, so, uh, it's an X. It, it's a Cairo symbol, yeah. Um, so he sees this sign, and under it, it reads, in this sign, conquer. He then apparently puts this symbol, has this symbol put on the shields of his army, And he whoops his enemy, Maxentius, and becomes the emperor of the western half of the empire. So he's proclaimed Augustus in 312, and he now considers himself Christian. The persecution was in 303 and lasting up till 312 in some places. And now the Augustus of the West calls himself Christian. Now, why did he do it? Why did he do it? There's a lot of debate over was Constantine genuine or was he faking it? Um, Was he faking it? Well, was it? Some people have suggested that 
he sees a nice system of control. You've got a system of bishops. Why don't I use that? This is a good way to unite the empire. Pretty poor argument, I think, because the Senate, the powerful parliament, effectively, is a bastion of paganism. You're going to offend all the conservative aristocracy of Rome by becoming Christians. Bluntly, the Christians are the slave class. Politically, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Now, what Constantine did is a little bit unclear. We're we're not quite sure. Did he make Christianity the the official state religion or not? We don't actually know. Uh, It was claimed in the 4th century by Christians that he did we don't have solid evidence. But certainly he did all sorts of things to, to propagate Christianity. Now, let me tell you something about um, Do you know Jonathan Edwards? The Stephen um, 18th century British preacher um, based in New England. But he was a loyal servant of the crown. And he said... The conversion of the Roman emperor to Christianity was the greatest revolution on the face of the earth since the flood. Whoa! Why? Why did he think it was such a big deal? It it certainly was a whopping deal. Because, as Edward saw it, effectively that's the end of official paganism. Paganism just topples from that moment when the leader of the pagan world becomes Christian, that's the end of official paganism. Now, I think he's being a bit optimistic there. I don't think it is. But this is a massive deal, the emperor becoming Christian. What he does is he now starts getting Christians into positions of political influence. Things have really changed. Um, He does things like he refuses to sponsor gladiatorial shows anymore. So you can still put them on privately if you want, but just imagine renting the Colosseum and putting on a gladiatorial show. You've got to be loaded to do it. Loaded. And not many people are. Not many people can put one on twice. So that's the end of gladiatorial combat. Um, He diverts funds that were used for building temples now to be built, now now to use to build churches. So it's, a lot's changed. It used to be the case that if you rock up to your local Roman governor and tell him you're a Christian, that's a one-way ticket to death. Now you go and tell him you're a Christian and you might get a promotion. Wouldn't you like to be a Christian now? For all sorts of reasons. See how things are changing? Now what happens is he... Um, let me take you back to this. He's only the emperor of the western half the empire to start with. The next 10 years, he basically spends invading the East. So by 324, he's emperor of the East and West. Now, this is a little blip. For, this won't happen for long. You'll have two emperors again. But for a while, he's the emperor of both the East and the West. And this is making Christianity at least very acceptable. The thing you want to be into, the emperor's into it right across the Roman Empire. Constantine sets up the new Rome here at uh, at Byzantium, um, Constantinople, now Istanbul. He's got a nice summer palace just across across the water at Nicaea. And he called the council there of 300-odd bishops from across and a couple from outside the empire, basically to decide a few things, but particularly, who is Jesus? Is Jesus the eternal Son of God or not? I'm not going to get any further into that now because we're going to look at that in a lot more detail because it's so important this afternoon as we look at Athanasius this afternoon who was, he wasn't a bishop there but he was there at the Council of Nicaea. He was just a junior apprentice at the time. Um, So no one would have listened to him at the time but he was there and what happened at Nicaea debating who is Jesus would become Athanasius' life work. But can you just think how it was? In 325, these bishops, who are generally older men, come and they eat with the emperor and they discuss openly who Jesus is in front of the emperor. 
Many of them are pinching themselves. Many of them have got scars and mutilations because they've been through the great persecution. And here they are discussing who Jesus is with the emperor. Something extraordinary has happened. Something absolutely extraordinary has happened. But I want to take you, I want to leave Nicaea with you, we'll come back to that, and I want to take you back to Constantine and get you to... Okay, here's a little quiz for you. Who's that? And by the way, you can't say anything stupid because we don't actually know. But who do you reckon it might be? Who do you reckon? This, this is, it comes from Constantine's era. It's um, in Rome. Who might it be? Just shout out any impressions. Could be Jesus. Is it Elijah with the horses? The fiery chariot? Yeah. It does look like Alexander, doesn't it? Yeah. Alexander was also associated with someone. The sun god in the sun chariot with the solar disk behind his head and solar rays. It's generally thought to be Sol, the sun god. We don't know who it is. But in some ways it looks like Jesus as well. And that's the interesting thing, I think. What I think is one of the most interesting things to draw out of Constantine's life. He's a worshipper of Sol, who becomes a worshipper of Jesus, probably. But he seems to have read Jesus through solar lenses, if that makes sense. Yeah, know what I mean? So, for example, he gets Sunday to be a day off. Why? Well, that keeps two people happy, doesn't it? Sol and Jesus. Uh, in churches, you'll have a picture of Jesus in a round, lit disc up in a blue background heavens. Um, that's often called Christus Pantocrator, that sort of image you get to see of Jesus up there at the roof of the church, but like where the sun was. And so there's something interesting of um, how Constantine was in danger of fitting Jesus into the understanding of God he already had. And that's the interesting thing I think you see happening. And you see it happening down through church history. People fitting Jesus into the God they already worship, rather than letting Jesus overturn their understanding at what God's like. And you get to see this all down through um, history. Uh, I'm um, half Swedish, so I'm interested in um, the story of the church in Sweden. And with the conversion of the Vikings, guys and missionaries like St. Ansgar go in. And their temptation is they basically bring Jesus to this bunch of Norwegian berserkers who like wielding axes and who worship gods like Thor with Mully Crusher, his great hammer that he throws at people. With, with guys like that, it's very tempting for the missionaries to present Jesus as a god, as the lord of armies. Yeah? Though, like, you don't want to present Jesus meek and mild to the Vikings. So you basically go, Jesus could take Thor any day. He's just got bigger muscles than Thor. And the Vikings go, no, I'm interested. See? And so there's this, this temptation to present Jesus according to the expectations of people. So Constantine's got this soul interest. The Vikings like Thor and so on. Okay. That's a defining moment. The conversion of Constantine. Absolutely defining. So worth having in your mind. Now, someone mentioned about dumbing down discipleship. That issue becomes absolutely critical now for the church because it used to be very hard to be a Christian. And so the hardness of it basically sorted out the genuine from the less eager. Um, and especially if you're going to be open about being a Christian. It's 
is going to get you in trouble. It's not going to get you a promotion. Now things have really changed. And so people struggle with that. Well, the old guard of Christians certainly struggled with it. That if you were to be committed as a Christian, you could certainly have a reasonable expectation of martyrdom in the 200s, in the 3rd century. After Constantine's conversion, and increasingly, that's just not going to happen. And so you have a people wondering about what it means to look committed. How do you be committed as a Christian when everyone apparently is Christian these days, increasingly so, but they don't seem to behave Christianly. It doesn't seem to make much difference in their lives. So how do I show I'm a true believer? Well, the way it gets paved, really, by um, a guy called Antony in Egypt. Now, Antony, what he does is he leaves the hustle and bustle of Alexandria, which is the big city on the north coast of Egypt, and he goes out into the desert to become a hermit, to become monachos. Monachos means alone, to be single, to be a monk. He's the first monk. And the idea is that he will go out into this hard place and be absolutely committed, away from the taint of the city, and he'll be there. And there he would apparently wrestle with demons and that kind of stuff. So he would live a hard life, fasting, having visions, that kind of stuff. So Antony becomes the model of what it is to be spiritual SAS now. If you want to be committed, you can't get martyred, you can do an Antony. Right? So Antony starts, it used to be, you once, if, if you want to read inspiring Christian stuff, you read about Polycarp, who gets burned for his faith, and says, 80 and 6 years have I served Christ, I cannot reject him now. How could I reject so kind a Lord and Saviour? And he's killed. You can't read about people like that anymore, because they don't get killed anymore. So, who is inspiring? Antony, who, who leaves the taint of the city to become monarchos, to become a monk. Now, you read that, and most guys kind of go, that's cool, I don't quite know how to do it, where in the desert would I go? And it sounds a bit scary. So he has a disciple called Paconius, that you don't need to remember that name, who basically says, okay, what I'll do for you is I'll set up Antony boot camps for you. And we'll have a little demon in a cage and you can practice wrestling with him and you can have, you'll have a little cell so it'll feel like you're on your own and, and, and you can meditate. But actually then we'll come and have dinner together and no wine, obviously, apart from maybe Christmas. Uh, you know, so it won't be quite as tough and you can train up there and then you go out and you do a real Antony and you actually become monocos, single, on your own, by yourself. And so what you have is you have, start having the establishment of official monasteries, collections of monocos alone together. <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? But they're all trying to be away from the taint of this Christian nominalism that's got everywhere. And um, so you start seeing through the 4th century the growth of monasticism. And you start having, over these monastic communities, you'll have um, an abbot. Um, it comes from the word abba, father, the father of the community, um, who will look after them, show them how to do it. That kind of, they'll be run according to a rule, that sort of thing. See what's going on? But just to get you into the mindset a bit more, let me tell you about some lesser-known movements that are doing the same sort of thing um, as monasticism, same impulse. So monasticism becomes the big and lasting one, but there are some other movements that are basically rejecting nominalism. And so you have other people who are saying, okay, humanity is so corrupt, let's just get away from it to become pure. One of the other movements, apart from monasticism, was the grazer movement. Now the grazers um, were people who thought, humanity is so corrupt, I want to rid myself of my humanity. So they would feed, preferably on all fours, um, on just grass and roots and stuff. 
and the real hardcore grazers would chain themselves up to be like cattle. Yeah, so you try to be animal-like. So that was the grazer movement, um, more popular in some areas than others. Um, the Holy Fool movement, the Holy Fool movement, uh, very, very big in Syria. They love this one. Um, particularly in the East, they love the Holy Fool movement. Um, the Holy Fool movement was basically to say um, humanity in its mind has just become so degraded and nominal that what we need is we have people who will step outside of all that to be fools for Christ, as Paul put it, to be fools. And so we'll challenge the conventions of society. So, for example, one of the most famous um, was a guy called Simeon the Fool. And uh, Simeon, what he would do is he would just behave foolishly, publicly, for everyone to see, to challenge people. This is the origins of the court jester, by the way. The guy who's the idiot, sort of idiot savant, who everyone's going, there's actually a wisdom behind that idiocy. And so he can speak wise things, foolishly, even to the king. Yeah? And so Simeon, for example, in, in Syria, he would, um, on quiet fast days, he would publicly eat vast amounts of beans. And you know what happens on a quiet day when you eat beans. <laughs> and he would disrupt services and he would streak through um, public meetings, um, that kind of stuff. And the, the, his ministry really ended. Um, he streaked naked into the women's bathhouse to show how foolish he was. The women didn't think he was being such a fool. And so they just beat him up and <laughs> chucked him out. But that's the thing. You see what he's trying to do. Um, then you have the Stylite movement, um, particularly big in Syria as well. Um, comes out of uh, Simeon the Stylite. Uh, he's a 5th century guy. <coughs> Simeon the Stylite, <coughs> he sat on top of a 50-foot pole for 40 years. So he was really being monocos um, by himself. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not ouch, there's a little platform at the top. You know. But he's got to be there in all weathers. And at the top of his pole, there was a little ladder at the back so his friends could bring him a little bit of food every now and again. And at the top of this pole for 40 years, whatever the season, um, it would get a bit smelly up there. And he would try to hurt himself through various exercises. So his biographer says <clears throat> that to the oohs and ahs of the crowd, he managed to touch his feet with his head 1,244 times in succession. And there'll be crowds going, wow, this guy is holy. And uh, his biographer, in fact, says that the crowds would gather to, I quote, worship the worms as they dropped from his body. But you see, basically, this is monasticism on speed, <laughs> Right? So, so the guy who brings monasticism to the West, it's particularly it starts in Egypt, spreads from the East into the West, becomes big. Um, a guy called Benedict of Nursia starts up a major monastery. It becomes a sort of mother monastery of the West at Monte Cassino, uh, not too far from Naples. And he's a guy who basically, um, whenever he has a lustful thought, strips off his clothes and rolls in nettles and brambles. And so you see the kind of mentality. It's very much a... You punish the flesh. You have a decadent society, asceticism, um, retreat from the world. That kind of mentality is becoming very big. But you see where it's coming from, a rejection of nominalism. All the while, though, of course, monasticism is getting softer and softer. It's getting easier and easier to be a monk. There are more of these monastic communities. And they become more and more like retirement homes, bluntly. Um, and so if you're old you know, and you, you can't really look after yourself, you think, well, I might as well take a monastic vow and I'll get looked after by everyone. And, um, and then if you've got too many kids, well, you can give one of your kids to the monastery and they'll look after them. And so what happens is increasingly you have a population in the monasteries who aren't particularly committed. Like you have kids who are put there, they're called oblates, and they didn't take any vow. They didn't choose to go there. They were just chucked there by their parents. So you've got a monastic community that's not especially committed. You've also got, when, um, 
very quickly, the western half of the empire declines and falls. The Goths invade, take over. Um, by the end of the 5th um, century, there's no Roman emperor. The strongest guy in town is the Bishop of Rome. Someone's got to run the show. And so the Bishop of Rome takes political control. Um, he, he's called the Papa, the Father, the Pope of his people. And he, someone's got to take control. And he's a strong guy and he does it. You see where it's all leading. And the Pope is going to absolutely make sure that his clergy in the monasteries actually have some kind of theological knowledge, some kind of education. And so education becomes the preserve of the monasteries. Outside the monasteries, the Germans are just running amok everywhere. So you can't really sit down and study because you'll get hit by a goth. And so increasingly, education and literacy belongs to the clergy in these monasteries tucked away whilst society is collapsing everywhere. See what's going on? Do you see how that set the trajectory? So with the conversion of Constantine, this rejection of nominalism, the rise of monasticism, the rise of the Bishop of Rome protecting the monasteries, that's starting to set a trajectory for how the next thousand years are going to look. And to be honest, we don't know an awful lot for the next thousand years because the Germans are running amok everywhere and you don't have any great theologians after the guys we're going to look at this afternoon for the next six, seven hundred years or so well Rome is repeatedly sacked yeah, fifth century, Rome is repeatedly sacked, the two major sackings are 410 and 476 so 476 really is the total collapse of the western half of the empire and by then, the emperor of the east in Constantinople, he just couldn't care about the west. He's just not interested. And so you have the Byzantine Empire in the east, and they call themselves the Roman Empire. They think of themselves as Romans, and they last for another thousand years. So the Roman Empire lives on in the new Rome until the 15th century and then it's destroyed, and a lot of its Greek texts make their way, get smuggled into the West, and the people start reading Greek texts again, and that's going to foster a whole new load of learning. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalisation. And Newton House, Oxford, invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.viola.gy.